Today, I'm gonna to give my thoughts on how do we get out of a viral pandemic? And I think the answer to that is science. To survive a pandemic, uh, the first thing I think we need to do is figure out testing. We have to know where the pathogen is, what it, problems it's causing, how it's transmitted, the epidemiology of a virus infectious agent, and then we need to know how to treat it. So how do we help people who already have it? And then vaccine is how to protect the ones that are at risk. And with any pandemic, we go in each of those steps of testing, treating vaccines. Here are a bunch of tests that we've actually validated. And many of these are already FDA approved now or have gotten emergency youth authorization. And we're still in the process of validating a whole bunch of tests. Some of these tests at the, are PCR tests and they detect the actual virus that someone has in the sputum or in their nose or in their saliva. These are all ways that we're testing at the moment. And the other tests that are coming are called serology tests. And those tests test for antibodies. Those are the, our own, my own. If I got infected, my body makes an immune response to it called an antibody. And that antibody we can detect with a different kind of test. The nice thing about the serology tests are they're usually easier to make and easier to validate. But what we've noticed is that uh, the validation just hasn't been there. So they haven't been quite as useful. While the PCR tests have become very useful in this setting. We learned partnering with our ophthalmology colleagues over at UCSD. Inflammation is still a problem with this infection. We weren't quite aware of this at the beginning, but when someone gets this infection and the body makes an immune response, it causes inflammation. And inflammation can be anywhere in the body. It can be in the heart, it can be in the brain. Those things can cause heart attacks and stroke. But it also turns out that it can be in the eye. And when we looked, uh, well, when ophthalmologists looked under special things here, you can see that in the eye, there's all these little bright lights, and especially in these boxes. And what this represents is increased inflammation. And the person didn't even know that they had all these inflammatory cells that were in the eye, but after their COVID infection, we could see them. So that told us that throughout the body, inflammation is a problem and that we will need to learn how to address it. The next thing we've done is to look at one of the body's immune responses called T cells. And in T cells, this is, um, a really nice paper that we partnered with with La Jolla Institute of Allergy and Immunology. And up here, here at the top, we have a virus that goes into the person, the person breathes it in, and then the body makes a very specific immune response called a T cell response. And there are CD4 T cells and there are CD8 T cells. And each one of those does a different thing. And they each one of those reacts to a different part of the virus. And here are different components like a spike protein, an M protein, an N protein, et cetera. And when somebody became infected that we could see from our COVID clinic, we saw that they generated really strong responses to these different viral proteins. And what that told us was that a vaccine might be possible if it targeted this particular of immune response called T cells. The other thing that was interesting was that people who had not been infected with COVID-2, COVID or the, the uh, infection that causes COVID-19, they still had previous infections to other coronaviruses. And we could see that there was some overlap, that some of their T cells here in the bottom side, some of their T cells also responded to the SARS-2 uh, protein, such as the spike or the M protein. And that told us that there was some overlap. Now that actually could be good for vaccine development, or it could actually be bad because we don't know that if some of that inflammation that we're seeing like in the back of the eye that they saw in the ophthalmology group is remnants of what that inflammatory reaction is to other coronaviruses. So that still needs to be teased out, but that's something that we're working on hard. The other immune response that people have is called antibodies, and those are made by P B cells or plasma cells. And we were very interested in antibodies. And the reason we were interested in antibodies, which are used in serologies, but also that they can actually be used as treatments. And here we took people from our COVID clinic who were previously infected with uh, COVID-2 and developed an infection and had a disease process, cough, shortness of breath, and pneumonia, but they did okay. We took blood from them afterwards to pull out those B cells. Within just a matter of six, seven weeks, we were able to go from collecting the B cells to isolating the antibodies and turn them into actual therapies. And that's what this graphic at the bottom is. And we're currently in the process working with the Scripps Institute um, to turn these into actual drugs that can be used for uh, patients. So the other thing that we've been working at uh, that we think is very important is when do we open up 
the rest of the world? How do we open up labs? How do we open up schools, et cetera? It, the way that we test right now is just so expensive. It takes 70 to $150 for each one of those tests for a nasal swab. How can we make it cheaper? And one thing that my lab has worked on previously that we are now using for this is called pooled testing. And basically we can reduce the number of tests used and possibly open up clinics or fire departments or police safely by pooling. And what happens is in my lab every day, people come in and we swab them. Um, so everybody gets a nasal swab. They actually do it on their own now. And then we put it in this viral transport media here in this little tube. And then we pull five to 10 people who's ever working on that shift into one sample. And then we test that one sample. And if it's negative, then we know that the test is good enough to say that everybody in the pool is negative and can go to work. And it takes about an hour in our current uh, platform to get that result. If one of those tests are positive, then we go back and test every single person along the way to find who was that was positive. And when they're positive, we send them to get uh, medical care and at home, et cetera. So another big thing we're focused on is treatments. And here is uh, my lab manager, uh, Carol Ignacio, in her uh, BSL-3 containment suit. Because it's so infectious, we have to have a special suit to go into the area, to the lab where we actually do the testing, and she's in charge of that. The first thing we've been doing is repurposing old treatments. So we look at other uh, therapies that are out there. There was some made for the first SARS-1 and the other virus called MERS, and also been used, try to be used for Ebola called remdesivir. And we participated in that big clinical study that did show that that medication has some efficacy for coronavirus too. And we now use that as a treatment in the hospital, which is really good. We're also looking at making new treatments. So we're partnering with Scripps for screening large libraries, also with uh, Sanford Burnham. So everybody across the Meta, Mesa is pitching in. We've identified 12 new drugs and those clinical trials, seeing if they can go into different clinical trials is in progress now. And that's pretty exciting. And some of our professors like Dr. Shiresh and Dr. Bar Barner have medications that look like might be very useful for coronavirus. And we're working on getting those tested. We're also making new ones, so to better understand the pathology, the pathophysiology inside the lung is being done in our special, uh, what we call BSL-3 containment labs, where we can grow the virus and test it out, done by Dr. Prusak and Dr. Fuster. And then the monoclonal antibodies are really big at the moment, and we're, uh, we're getting ready to test those, but so are small molecules like small interfering RNAs that might mess up um, the life cycle of the virus. The other one that everybody wants to talk about is vaccines, which I'm also excited about and UCSD is working hard on. Uh, some things that I want to highlight, one of those is the Inovio vaccine. Many people might have heard about that. That's a San Diego company. And they make a DNA-based vaccine. And basically that means they take DNA, the nucleic acid, and put it into a vaccine that's then injected and it produces a protein that's from the virus. And that sets up an immune response, both a T cell response and a B cell response that hopefully can protect somebody. The other vaccine that we're really interested in that we're gonna be the only site for testing, at least for the phase one, is called the Synvivio vaccine. And this is what's described here. And basically uh, we take a bacteria that we all have in our gut and we give it uh, a special little bit of DNA called a plasmid. And the, D and the bacteria then makes a piece of the virus. So we drink the bacteria, the, the bacteria lives in our gut and releases little protein pieces of the vaccine and that stimulates an immune response in our gut. And the thought here is that once the vaccine uh, immune response is stimulated in the, in the gut for the virus that sets up a different, more protective and perhaps longer lasting uh, vaccine. The other bragging thing is that UCSD is gonna be one of the sites for the large NIH vaccine uh, program for coronaviruses, and we're getting underway with that. So there's gonna be lots of new vaccine studies coming our way. So future directions, I used to be a Boy Scout, and the motto of the Boy Scout is to be prepared. Um, and, you know, in my lifetime, we've had so many viral pandemics that it's kind of odd that we've been uh, surprised by this one. Uh, we had HIV, we've had SARS-1, we had the swine flu, the avian flu, Ebola, Zika, we all remember this. And now uh, we have COVID-2, um, or junior as I like to say. 
But how do we prepare? How do we keep from getting caught off guard over and over again? I really think that we need to come up with basically a preemptive war. We need to know what the potential infectious threats are out there and develop plans to how to conquer it ahead of time. One of the things that I would really like to see is that when the next viral pandemic go, comes, a, comes about, we have it squashed and have it completely taken care of before it's actually gotten out to cause news or economic loss or death. Um, the best thing would be uh, not to be noticed at all. Um, and that's my hope. But I wanted to thank you for your attention today.